Very well. So, AI safety. It's a very interesting topic. I particularly find it very fascinating to the extent that I've dedicated my entire career to AI safety. What do I mean by AI safety? For that, we need to go back to a question we asked in the very first lecture. If you recall, we had a slide on this. We are trying to make more intelligent AI. We are trying to make general purpose AI. We are trying to make agents that can do quite literally everything that we can do, and even more. But what if we succeed? Science fiction has been very active in answering this question. Artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. This is an actual headline, and it's not a rare headline. We get to see this headline every couple of days, at least in these days. Is there any merit to it? Out of curiosity, how many of you think that artificial intelligence could actually cause the extermination of the human race? How many of you think that it can't? How many of you don't care? Good. So let's look at a few examples of what has happened so far. Deploying machine learning in the real world has real world consequences. A good example is what has happened to Tesla. The Tesla autopilot is a good instance of machine learning and intelligent systems deployment in critical circumstances. You've probably heard the news of a Tesla crashing into a truck killing its passenger slash driver, as well as other instances of self-driving cars causing fatal damage. I believe the latest instance was only a few months ago. The one that made the most noise was about a year or two years ago in Arizona, when I believe it was Google self-driving or Uber self-driving vehicle on a test mission, which ran into a pedestrian and caused a very, very tragic fatality. So yes. So far, we see that our current state of AI can go wrong. Another example is uh, the very unfortunate event happened in Google's object recognizer. So if you have an Android phone, you know that Google allows you or allows your phone to do automatic object detection and recognition in your images. If you have an image of powers, it's going to annotate it as buildings or towers. If you have an image of just a part of a wing, it's going to annotate it as an airplane. If you have an image of a car, it's going to annotate it as a car. Now, something horrible happened just a, a few months ago. Let me see how long ago was it. It was uh, in July of, I believe, 2015 or 2000. 16, when that model made a huge mistake. A black user took a selfie and passed it to this model, and then the model misclassified it as a gorilla. That's a horrible, horrible thing that a that an object detection model can do out in the real world. If it weren't Google's, the company that created and deployed this model would have been brought to its knees. I've actually done a little bit of reading in, into the cost of this mistake. Google had to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in PR to make up for the damage incurred by this mistake. Why did it happen? Oh. It was a fault in machine learning. Maybe they didn't have enough uh, training examples from black faces. Maybe it was something else. What else can go wrong? Adversarial examples. So we've already talked about this in passing in a few lectures. Imagine there's a self-driving car with a camera on top of it, and the objective of the camera is to well first recognize where it is and recognize the road and all that, and also to recognize road signs. Now it's been shown that if you 
apply minor perturbations to input images or just input samples to a deep learning model, you can fool that model into making an incorrect prediction. And when you do that intentionally, those perturbations are called adversarial examples. Imagine somebody doing that to a stop sign. So the self-driving car would incorrectly recognize the stop sign as a speeding sign. What are the consequences of that? Instead of stopping, the car is going to go 60 miles an hour and it may cause a horrific accident. There are many instances of AI failure or machine learning failure in the real world. We're gonna go over some of those, but let's start from something that has touched almost every one of us. This example is from Stuart Russell at UC Berkeley. So let's look at the problem of optimizing click-through. What does that mean? You work for Facebook, you're working on the, uh, what do they call it? Timeline system. So every Facebook profile has a timeline. What you see on that timeline and the order of things that you see on that timeline are actually the result of a machine learning system. What's the idea here? Let's say you as an engineer want to optimize the type of political news that are shown on a particular timeline. Let's assume that the political spectrum is uh, something that starts from neo-fascist on the conservative right and Berkeley leftist liberal on, <coughs> excuse me, on the other side of this uh, spectrum. So a typical person would probably fall somewhere in between in terms of their interests. Very few people are extremely to the right and very few people are extremely to the left. So what happens in click-through optimization in the beginning, first, something to the right may have been shown to the user. The user does not click on it. So that was an example of a failure. Something to closer to the right might have been shown to the user. The user doesn't click on it. That's a failure. Now something more towards the middle is shown to the user and the user clicks on it. So that's a success. Then, more samples are gathered, and ideally, something like this should happen. The user clicks a lot more on instances that are in the middle. Okay, so this is the idea. Another example is for somebody who's very ultra-right, very conservative, let's call them neo-fascists for the purposes of this example. The idea is for any news article, shown to the user that lies within this particular spectrum of political views, the user would play, would click on those and everything else is a no. However, what happened in the end was a little different. First of all, let me tell you a bit about what's going on behind this optimization. It's not a person who's optimizing it. It's an algorithm of what type? Typically reinforcement learning. So there's a reinforcement learning algorithm. What's the objective of that reinforcement learning al algorithm? Maximize click-through. Maximize the number of all articles that the user is clicking on. The idea in the engineer's mind who was designing it was to figure out what the interest of the user is and then tune the timeline or newsfeed according to the interests of the user. What ended up happening was a little different. First, let's say somebody is a little to the right. So the optimizer, this recommendation system, starts recommending more articles that are closer to the right than those that are closer to the left. Over time, the user learns to like more things that are towards the right. Why? Because it gets to read less articles from the left. 
So it's view, the user's views become a little more radical. <coughs> Excuse me. The user becomes a little more radical because it only sees articles that are towards the right. And you see that the user's interests keep shifting towards being a neo-fascist. So if you go back to your families, wherever they're from, you'll see that their views, if they are active users on social media, they see that their views may have become a little more extreme than it was before. And it's a result of this particular, it's partly a result of this particular fault. A very simple reinforcement learning algorithm with a decent looking objective. What was that objective? Maximize click through by learning what the user's interests are has led to a cultural shift that may result in, let's say, breaking the European Union with Brexit or what's happening in Poland, or result in the demise of the Western democracy with what happened here in the US in 2016. Was that intentional? To the extent of our knowledge, no. What was the fault then? Where does this problem come from? That's what this lecture is about. We're going to talk about how we can make our AI <coughs> more beneficial in general. So why would we want to talk about AI safety? Well, for a number of reasons. One is, well, AI can be misused. How many of you have heard of deep fakes? Only one person? Do you want to see a demo of deep fakes? Okay, let's see. Can you hear the audio? Sorry, it doesn't have any audio and I can't connect my laptop's audio to it. But the idea is this video is fake with a very realistic sounding voice and that of Barack Obama telling us things that he wouldn't normally say. That's an example of a deep fake generated through deep generative adversarial networks, something that is readily available to everyone. There was a huge epidemic of deep fakes arising last year when this technology was really readily available to a lot of normal users. And this is a very, very severe problem arising from the misuse of AI. Can you think of an example of how this technology could be misused? Venu? Uh, what was that? In the TV series Blacklist. Mm -hmm, okay. So what they do is that uh, AI company's CEO was actually used to make that deep fake and his kill later by the CEO. Okay. I have to look into that. So, yeah. Hacking. Hacking. Tell me more. That's a good example of misuse in AI, using AI for automated penetration testing and hacking. That's one of the things that my lab is actively working on. But for deep fakes in particular, it can be used for political manipulation. If I had not told you that this was not a video recorded of Obama, of uh, a fake Obama, you could have really easily believed that the video is real and the message disseminated by the video is real. And this is one of the things that has been growingly used by uh, disinformation campaigns, mostly routed or rooted in Russia. What else? So other than misuse, 
the AI itself can behave deleteriously in a way that we don't want unintentionally. These are called faults or safety issues in general. One example is fairness. That's example of a misdetection of a black face as a gorilla is a horrible example of fairness. Another example of fairness is machine learning models used in the judicial system here in the US used for prediction of how likely it is that an offender, somebody who's already in the prison system, re-offends. This is used for parole decisions. There was a huge scandal uh, some time ago around the fact that that model is hugely biased against black people here in the US. So <clears throat> unfortunately, we won't have to, we, we won't be able to go through the fairness problem today. Uh, I've already provided a link to a more detailed discussion on the fairness problem in machine learning, and I highly encourage you all to watch that discussion. Most of what we are going to talk about today are technical faults that arise from uh, issues such as self safe exploration or adversarial robustness. One interesting problem that we are going to focus on is the alignment problem. Uh, we'll talk about all of these as we go along. So one way to classify the space of safety problems in AI is through this classification. The safety problem can arise from a, an incorrect or incomplete a specification. What does that mean? Well, we'll go into that, but remember, most of what we've learned so far in AI is some sort of optimization. So misspecifying the objective of that optimization can be the root cause of all evil. We'll see how. There's another category, robustness. Is the AI system, the AI agent that we have trained or deployed robust to minor changes in its deployment environment? Is it able to handle the uh, non-stationary uh, input sets? And then there's another set of problems called assurance. What's the idea behind assurance first? make sure that we are able to analyze and monitor the activity of the AI after it's deployed or before it's deployed uh, to see whether there is a fault or not, to be able to detect faults and prevent faults. More formally, remember this. This is the optimization objective for reinforcement learning, right? Is it correct? This is for policy learning. Is this a correct optimization objective? How many of you believe that the answer is yes, it is correct? How many of you believe that the answer is no? Good response. Very enthusiastic. So just a quick reminder, there is a small factor missing here, the discount factor. That can actually be the root cause of a lot of our misconceptions and incorrect designs for AGI and lifelong learning systems. What's AGI? Artificial General Intelligence. The type of AI that can do, that can do general problem solving in any domain. Very similar to what we do. If, if I, as a natural instance of intelligence, decide to go and become a pilot, I have the mental or cognitive capacity to do so. I can do it. A general uh, artificial intelligence or AGI is the same. It can move from one problem to the other without major changes in the underlying uh, design or structure. Now, a recent paper by a colleague of mine showed that that discount factor may actually be the root cause of a lot of problems. We'll talk about that in the end if you have time. But in general, let's assume this is correct, even without the mention of the discount factor. 
So one problem is this R, the reward function. Where does this reward function come from? Where do we get that reward from? So far, we've assumed that we design that reward function. But our design is not always complete. Just like the example of click-through optimization. Let me give you another example. We've probably talked about this example before. You have a self-driving car. It's trained to maximize a particular objective. Get from point A to point B in a certain in minimum time. You want to get from the campus here at West Haven to JFK. You get into the car. You tell it, hey, I want to get to JFK in under an hour. It gets you to JFK, but by the time you get there in under an hour, there will be SWAT cars following you. There will be National Guard helicopters flying over you. Why? Because your car has run over a number of pedestrians. No one told it 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 is not supposed to kill, right? That wasn't in the optimization objective. It has probably caused countless accidents. That wasn't in the optimization objective, right? There were, it has probably run through homes and buildings and malls and uh, those kinds of stuff. We didn't tell it that, hey, don't run into homes. We just said, get us from point A to point B in under an hour. So you see that this Innocent looking optimization objective may actually result in loss of life. This is called a, a specification fault. We've misspecified the objective. Another example comes, another uh, issue comes from what's available to us to learn from the data set or the environment. This expectation sign here is over the data available to you. What about rare cases? What if <coughs> Excuse me, there's a particular fault that, or a particular situation that the agent is not, has not seen during training. There was a very interesting example in a talk given by one of these, by the CEO of one of these self driving car companies. The example was there is, this is an actual example. There was a cyclist with a stop sign on his back. If the self-driving car is moving forward and then suddenly sees the cyclist, what is it supposed to do? Stop? We don't know. Well, the, the agent during training has not seen such rare instances. What about adversaries? Those who are intentionally trying to um, get the policy or the agent to misbehave or do something unexpected. Is that already taken care of in the data scene during training? That's a problem of robustness. And then there is a loose correspondence between all of these different categories and what you see in this equation, but it's still insightful. You're doing maximization. How good is your approximation? How good is your maximization or optimization process? That's a problem of assurance, making sure that your approximated function, in this case a policy, is good enough. We know that it's an approximation. It's not an exact solution. It's an approximation of what the optimal policy should look like. How good is it is the problem of assurance. So let's talk a little more about a specification. Let's look at a few examples. So in this example, an evolutionary algorithm was used to train an agent to move from a human or a skeleton to move from one point to the other. You see how weird their solutions are? Jump up and down, rotate, and so on. So this is one example. Let me show you another interesting example. So some of you worked on reinforcement for your term project, worked on reinforcement learning for games. This is an example of a game 
that was and you can see an RL agent trained to solve this game. What's the optimization of the game? Go as far as you can while maximizing your points. How do you maximize points? If you eat one of those green things on the way, <coughs> you get more points. This particular example shows you that the policy decides to go in a loop on that map and eat any of those blue or green uh, food points to maximize its reward while not getting to the final uh, point of the game. So it doesn't progress. It just runs in the loop and eats more to gain more reward. That's probably not what, what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to finish, pass the finish line and maximize the reward. This is a problem in specifying the reward function, right? But what do you expect? You get what you optimize for. These are the problems coming from what you've given the agent. The agent is expected, we are expecting the agent to optimize for the objective we've given it, right? Maximize the reward function that we've given it. So just a quick review. So the standard model for AI is to maximize a reward function. We've talked about this a few slides ago. And the agent is going to say, okay, I'm going to do it for you. But this gives rise to a problem that is actually not new at all. It's very ancient. Does anyone know the story of King Midas? So it's an ancient story. There are many, many similar stories around the same moral line. King Midas went to a wizard and said, or a god, and said, hey, I want everything that I touch to turn into gold. And the wizard of God granted his wish. King Midas went out, touched a table, it turned into gold. Touch a tree, it turned into gold. Everything he touched turned into gold. Then he went back to the dining room of his castle and wanted to eat. Touch the spoon, it turned into gold. But then when it touched the food, the food turned into gold as well. He couldn't eat. He wanted to hug his daughter. It was her graduation, let's say. When he touched his daughter, she turned into gold. There are other well-known stories of this type where the morale of the story, the point of the story is careful what you wish for, careful what you're optimizing for. This is a huge problem in AI. You have to specify your R correctly, your reward function, but can you? Well, not always. Let's look at a few attempts to make the specification problem less painful. What if we train agents with a human in the loop? So we say, hey, there is an R. Either it's correct, it's accurate, or it's not. We want some sort of human supervision. So what does it look like? There's a human objective. There is something we want the agent to accomplish, right? Typically, the belief is, or what we do typically, what we have done so far is we say, hey, there is a human objective. I'm the human, so I know what my objective is. And then I'm going to define that mathematically and give it to the machine. That results in SWAT cards following your self-driving car. Why? First of all, because we don't always know everything that we want. Our objective is not well known to us. There are a lot of nuances that we often either are not aware of or don't consider. <coughs> and second, writing everything that we are interested in is really difficult. So we often come up with simplified abstractions of what we are interested in. However, 
most of our agents, most of the AI agents that we are creating are solving problems that are typically solved by humans, right? Let's think about driving. Where do we see a good example of self-drive, uh, of driving? Well, in, in human driving, right? Typically human driving does not include many instances of crashes. That's actually not true. I want you to keep that in mind. The entire point, the entire selling point behind self-driving cars is human drivers make mistakes. And we want to automate driving so that we can reduce the number of accidents caused by human mistakes. But let's assume that human behavior is more generalizable, more robust to changes, small changes in the environment. The idea behind this class of solutions to the specification problem, getting the human in the loop, is to treat the human objective as a latent variable. We don't know what the human objective is. We see how the human behaves. Now we want to get to machine behavior by reasoning something or inferring the latent variable, which is the human objective. So let's think about an example, image classification. Typically, what happens in image classification, remember MNIST, when we did digit recognition using BaseNets and then perceptrons, and then if you watch those uh, subsequent lectures using neural networks and deep learning, what's the objective minimized loss with typically a uniform loss function or loss matrix? So, this type of approach resulted in accidentally classifying a human as a gorilla. This is something that we don't want. And then a typical company has to spend millions fixing public relations, the public relations disaster. What's the new idea? Instead of using a single loss matrix or a uniform loss matrix, use a structured prior distribution over loss matrices. Some examples are safe to classify, but for others, say you don't know. There are those that you're not sure about. There is an image of a black lady. You're not sure because you don't have enough data in your data set of black faces. You're not sure whether it's a black lady. I'm really sorry for using this metaphor, but this is something that has happened in the real life. Black lady or any other class. So you're not sure. Your certainty is really low. In those cases, instead of spitting out the maximum, the class with the maximum probability, just ask a human moderator. Use active learning to gain additional feedback from humans. Hey, human, my creator, I've seen this particular instance. I'm not sure which class it belongs to. You tell me. This is how one of the ways you can involve humans in the loop. We are going to skip this example. In reinforcement learning, there's a plethora of different approaches to this uh, type of problem. One very simple example is behavior cloning. What's the idea behind behavior cloning? So you hire a human agent, let's say, somebody who's really good at the game of Pong, the Atari game. And you ask them to play the game for like 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours. When they're, while they are playing, you record everything they've done. You record the state of the game, the action they've chosen, the resulting reward, and the next state. Remember that this tuple, we already talked about it in our reinforcement learning. We record all of those tuples, and then what we have is a data set. We have a data set of state and action taken by a human agent. This is very similar to having a data set of images of handwritten digits and the correct label for those images, right? You do supervised learning. This is called behavioral cloning. It's very simple, right? You don't, you're not solving the RL problem here. You're solving a supervised learning problem. 
this is very myopic, as in it doesn't really deal with cases where uh, the sequential act actions lead to unseen circumstances. There are some approaches like inverse reinforcement learning or generative adversarial uh, re inverse reinforcement learning or inverse learning, IRL and Gale. These are really interesting. They try to reverse engineer the dynamics of decision making in observed human play or human behavior. There are some approaches based on coaching. Hey, coach, human coach, I do not know what I need to do here, or I've done this. Is it good or is it bad? So it's intermittent human input. It doesn't require 10 or 20 hours of human input. And there's a third approach called RL from modeled rewards. So look at how others, how other agents like human agents are solving the problem and try to model the reward, the reward function of the human based on the observation of how a human acts. Now here's a quick comparison. First of all, what problem are we trying to solve here? My agent isn't superhuman enough. So you want to enhance the performance of your agent, and you want it to do better than the human. Imitation learning, or behavioral cloning in general, and then IRL, uh, inverse reinforcement learning, at best gets you to the level of human performance. Why? Because they are learning from human agents. If you're using intermittent coaching, getting some guidance, some feedback from a human while training, you may get slightly better than human. If you use RL from model rewards approaches, your performance can get a lot better than the human agent. So how does this work? Here's the cycle of how it works. The agent, Let's start from here. The agent observes the environment, makes an, makes an action. Then something happens, the environment changes. The user then provides some feedback on how well that action was, how well that particular behavior was. And these two, the feedback and the observation, allow us to approximate a correct reward model or a good reward model. The reward model itself is a function that you're trying to approximate. It's something that you're trying to learn. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this reward function uh, enables the agent to make better decisions on what actions to take and so on. So this is going to dip into the mathematics of one approach. It's really simple. It's as I said, but just mathematically. And you can see that compared to in uh, Atari bench, in the Atari benchmark, if you're interested in reinforcement learning and learning more about it, or if you've already done some research in reinforcement learning, you see that the, the universally accepted benchmark for deep reinforcement learning is the Atari game set. So the game of Pong, or let's say uh, Breakout. Those games are used as benchmarks to see how well, how much better your approach is uh, than compared to some other approach previously uh, presented. And it's been shown, this is a relatively recent result, that uh, reward modeling actually outperforms uh, vanilla or without typical uh, reinforcement learning approaches. So there's a small problem, or actually there's a good way to check the model that the model of the reward learned through RL with uh, reward modeling. It's been shown that if you freeze a successfully trained reward model and then train a new agent on that reward model in a classical sense, the agent finds loopholes. It finds mistakes in the original reward model. 
So um, there have been some proposals on how to solve this problem. We can train the reward model online together with the agent and so on. But this is an ongoing line of research and things are still developing. Let's quickly look at some other specification work. So this is an interesting proposal. Again, it's very recent from 2018. Avoiding unsafe states by blocking actions. Look at that uh, block diagram up here. The environment M is observed by the RL agent. There's a human overseer that sometimes gives some feedback on how well a particular state or a particular action in a particular state is. And through that, the agent can learn which actions or which states to avoid. So this is an interesting recent uh, problem. This is going to be a lot more interesting, the shutdown problem. Imagine you have a cleaning robot. Its objective is to get, is to clean the room whenever there is dirt. Now, <coughs> you have this robot at home. The robot looks at the room and sees your cat. And suddenly it says, dirt, I've got to go clean that dirt. It starts moving towards your cat. And then in a dramatic slow motion movement, you run towards your robot and go for its shutdown button. The robot sees you and then runs away from you. You go closer to its shutdown button. The robot sees you and runs away from you. It doesn't allow you to press the shutdown button. Why? Because its objective says, if you see dirt, clean dirt. If it's very well optimized for that objective, it has learned that being shut down is very, very damaging to achieving its objective. So it's going to prevent you from shutting it down. This is called the shutdown problem. How can we solve the shutdown problem? Well, there are some interesting solutions. One solution proposed by Oxford and DeepMind in 2016 was to say, hey, if there is an interruption signal or an attempt to shut down the <coughs> agent, treat it as data to learn from. So they assume an online learning situation where all agents are learning all the time. And whenever there's an attempt to turn it off, just treat your observ the observation of being turned off as part of your training and then Train on, uh, when you train on that data, you learn that it's okay to sometimes allow others to turn you off. I have issues with this approach. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into those issues. Uh, one is how can you know for certain that a particular sequence of actions is leading to the shutdown? How do you know that the agent, that the user coming towards you with its finger is necessarily to shut you down? The other solution proposed by the Human Compatible AI uh, Center at Berkeley, I believe, it's called the off-switch game. It's a game theoretic solution. It says, retain uncertainty on the reward function. There is a reward function. We are uncertain of how good that reward function is. So there is some degree of uncertainty on how well the reward function or the resulting policy is. And if you see somebody coming to turn you off. If that somebody is your owner, you can assume that, hey, that owner, uh, the objective of that owner is what I'm optimizing for. So if he wants to shut me off, then that's probably part of, that's something I should learn from and add value to when I'm optimizing my solution. All of these are for agents that are still at training time. Now, this year, only a few months ago, uh, my co-author and I, Professor Shu and I, proposed se sequential triggers for deep RL agents. What's the idea here? The idea here is 
you train your RL agent in its typical environment, let's say cleaning a roof. Learn to clean the roof with the original uh, object. Then we create a virtual environment. We call it the watermarking environment, which can't happen in real life. And we train it with a new objective where a certain type of input, a certain type of input sample, input uh, observations can result in a shutdown. That objective is already given to us. We show that if you design the second objective um, with enough complexity, you can actually create password settings for shutting down the agent. What do I mean by password settings? Let's say you have this cleaning robot. This cleaning robot is moving around in the environment. Instead of having an off switch, you say, GOAT Spaceship Google. These three keywords mention in an unlikely sequence, trigger the second policy or the second task policy of the agent, which results in a shutdown. So this is another recent contribution to the shutdown problem. Let's talk about assurance a little. Remember the problem of assurance was to analyze, to be able to analyze, monitor, and control systems during operation. <clears throat> I'm going to talk mostly about my own work because I'm a little biased towards my own work. The DRL agents, deep reinforcement learning agents, that are considered to be a state of the art in AI and machine learning are shown to be very brittle. Some minor changes in, the, in their observation or the environment may result in their demise. There was a paper published in late 2016, early 2017 by myself and a colleague of mine, Professor Munir, that showed that you can manipulate the environment both at training time and at test time in a minimal and efficient manner, such that the train policy is fooled or the policy is trained to be a fool and does things that you don't want it to do. So now that we know this, how can we measure, let's say you work for a self-driving car, some self-driving car company, and then somebody comes and says, hey, I have this deep reinforcement learning policy that solves all of your self-driving needs. How do you measure the resilience and robustness of that policy? So earlier this year, I, along with a few of my colleagues, proposed a fighting fire with fire kind of approach to measuring resilience and robustness in deep reinforcement learning. First, let's define resilience and robustness at test time. We define resilience as a minimum number of state perturbations required to achieve a maximum adversarial regret, maximum loss of, uh, maximum loss of reward. And we define robustness as maximum adversarial regret achievable via a maximum budget of delta max. Let's say the adversary can, or the environment can have a maximum of five state perturbations. What is the maximum adversarial gain? Or what is the maximum regret, loss of reward that we can expect? That's robustness in our definition. Now we say, hey, Let's train a reinforcement learning agent to learn an optimal policy for what? For what objective? What's the reward? The reward here is to maximize loss in the other agent. We've already trained a DRL policy for self-driving. Now let's train another policy whose objective is to, is to minimize the reward or the return earned by the other policy. 
This is the adversarial setting I was talking about. There is a second reinforcement learning agent whose objective is to make the first reinforcement learning agent lose the game. And then accordingly, we come up with benchmarks for how well uh, those agents perform, how well different DRL policies perform. Now, let's talk about another problem in AI safety. A lot of the settings, a lot of the recent advances in AI, particularly those focused on creating artificial general intelligence, are very, very complex. OK. So if you want to look at the mathematics of the, for example, the underlying dynamics of a deep reinforcement learning training process and how it interacts with small perturbations in the environment, it's very complex. It's really hard to do a formal analysis of what's happening in a real environment. We make an observation here. AI safety as a field has been around for a while. And by a while, I mean about four or five years. So far, the major focus in the field of AI safety has been on safe design. Let's design agents that perform in a safe manner. Do good specification uh, of objectives and make sure that during training, everything is robust and so on. This requires formal analysis, which is already too difficult. And it requires technical abstraction. So you have to think about the training algorithms, go down to the level of training algorithms or model architecture. Is it a convolutional neural network with so many layers what happens if we change this and we change that? Deep neural networks, especially convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks, are notoriously difficult to formally analyze. There is, there's a need for higher level abstractions. So looking at the, this problem, a co-author of mine and myself went out and looked at parallel domains of uh, similar problems, like human cognition. So what we have in our brains is very similar, very close to general purpose intelligence. It's adaptive to dynamic environments. If something changes in our environment, we learn to adapt, right? However, we are also prone to psychological disorders. How do we define psychological disorders? Self-reconfigurations in cognition and behavior that are deleterious, meaning harmful, to the core and long-term objectives of self or the social ecosystem. Can you can you mention an example of a psychological disorder in us, humans? Depression. Depression. Does it conform with this definition? You're suffering, right? You're suffering from depression, which means that if there is a reward function in you, that tells you to maximize pleasure and minimize suffering, depression is disabling your pursuit of happiness, going after maximizing joy. Why? Because you're suffering. Also, when you're depressed, you can't get up and go to work. You don't have the enthusiasm or motivation to make progress towards a better life, right? What else? Can you think? Yes? Trauma. Or let's talk about a specific case. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which is a really well-known condition here in the US, especially among the uh, veterans. 
military veterans. That's a very interesting case. What else? Schizophrenia. What else? Addiction. Addiction is a, can be classified as a psychological disorder. Does that conform with our definition of psychological disorders? Self-reconfiguration in cognition and behavior. Is that a reconfiguration? Yes. You're not born addicted to, let's say, cigarettes. You're not born addicted to cocaine. Your cognition, your decision-making system has been reconfigured in a way that is harmful to the core and long-term objectives of self. You want to live the longest, right? Assuming that you want to live the longest. If you smoke, you already know that you're getting cancer. You already know that you're going to die soon. But the addiction is causing you to smoke more and live a shorter life. Can you think of a psychological disorder that's harmful to the social ecosystem, to the society? How about, what was that? Yes, but not necessarily. What if you are a reclusive alcoholic? What was that? No, 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 no. I mean, you're alcoholic, but you only stay in your apartment. You don't interact with anybody. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to extend that example to sociopath people or psychopath people who don't care about, who don't care about other people. And then there is sadism where the sadist prefers to inflict pain on other people. Do we want to stop those people? Yes. Do they want their disease to be stopped? We don't know. As far as I can tell, not necessarily. This is an ongoing discussion in uh, psychopathology. Let's draw a little bit of inspiration here. AI and AGI safety issues follow the same definition. Let's look at the definition. Unintended emergent behavior that is harmful to the core and long-term objectives of designer or the society. Hmm. Running over a person in the self-driving car example. That's an example of an AI safety problem, right? It's an unintended behavior that is harmful to the long-term objectives of both the designer and the society. What else? Can you think of any other examples? Yes. Uh, in the reward function where humans are actually decayed, like the reward function for the humans is also decayed. So in the post, suppose you got a human now, that doesn't matter after a thousand days. So that reward actually... Wow. That's a really, really, really interesting example. So if you have a constant discount factor, remember discount factor is telling you how much you care about events that happen further in time, right? You don't care as much about getting $10 in a year as much as you would care about getting $10 today. That's what discount factor represents in some sense. And that's one interpretation of the discount factor. Now, what Venu here is saying is, imagine there is an instance of a decision that would result in the suffering of some human, maybe your owner, in a month or two months. If you do not account for that, if the negative cost of that suffering is finite, 
what's going to happen is a constant discount factor, a uniform discount factor is going to tell you, hey, it's going to happen in two months. That suffering doesn't really matter. I'm going to enjoy what's happening now. Let's not care about that event further in the future. I actually had not thought about that thing. Let's write a paper on this. Thanks. So another example is I'm going to talk about a particular instance of uh, AI safety problems. Remember that cleaning robot? The cleaning robot's objective is to clean dirt whenever it sees dirt. It has a camera on board. What happens if it turns towards the wall and never sees the dirt? That's an optimal policy, right? It never sees the dirt, so there's never anything to clean. It's always at the state of best possible case. There is no dirt, right? That's called reward hacking. Reward hacking is when, or wire hitting, is when you do something that satisfies the written down objective, but it doesn't do exactly what your owner expected you to do. There are many examples of reward hacking in natural intelligence. One example is cheating at exams. Addiction is another example of reward hacking. Why does cheating at exams constitute an example of reward hacking? Well, you've paid to learn something in your course, right? If the decision was yours, your objective was to learn. And then if you cheat in the exam, it's because you haven't learned, you've received the grade, you've optimized for maximizing the grade, but you haven't learned anything, right? Okay. Interesting. Let me see, let me see. So, according to this, reviewer inspirations, we came up with a research framework. We said, let's model AI safety problems as psychopatholo psychopathological issues. Let's say when an AI agent, let's say like an RL policy, does something wrong or learns something that we don't like, it's probably due to a, it can be modeled as a psychopathological problem. We propose different components of AI psychopathology, like modeling and verification tools, classification and diagnosis of disorders, and treatment. I'm not gonna go too much into the details, but diagnosis of psychopathological disorders in humans occurs in multiple ways, like question and answering, or filling out a test, or just uh, hearing the uh, nar narrative of events from a relative or somebody else who's in charge with you. There is a catalog of psychopathological disorders and their symptoms for humans called DSM-5 and we propose the creation of DSM-5 for AI as well. As for treatment, how do we treat psychological problems in humans? Well, there's a chemical approach, pills, there is behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and there is um, psychotherapy we're talking about. it. We propose analogs for all of these for AI agents, including retraining camps or customized environments for retraining a policy or uh, virtual unreal forced reward signals, just like what the antidepressant does, 
it's an SSRI, selective serotonin uh, reintake inhibitor. It's like telling you that, hey, this is what you're doing right now is really good, a lot better than the original reward function would tell you. And what you did here was really bad, a lot worse than the original reward fun function told you. This is in a controlled environment. This is like pill therapy and so on. Let me see. That's interesting. So let's look at an example of this. We showed that. It, do you all remember the game of snake? It was in our old phones. We modified the game of snake a little. We, so typically, there is only one seed that you can take, and the, the snake can take, right? And it will add one point to its score, and it will add one to the lens. We added another seed. We added a drug seed, which adds k times r, k times the typical number to the reward, and a lot more than one to the length of the tail. We show that if this particular relationship exists between the factor k and uh, the initial length and the discount factor, a Q learning agent training to solve the game of snake learns an addicted policy. What does that mean? It decides to go for the drug seed a lot more than the blue typical seed. It gives it an instantaneous high. So it gets a really high reward at a particular moment, at that instant. But since it's adding a lot to its length, it increases the chances of the snake eating its own tail prematurely and dying. So we show that it's easy. It can be done to model the reward hacking, an AI safety flagship problem, as a psychological problem, i.e. addiction. So this work was heavily covered in the news. Uh, if you're interested in reading the news articles or the interviews, you can go to my website. What about the ongoing research in AI safety? Well, remember, assistant games is a game theoretic setting in which the human agent is involved in providing some feedback or controlling the training of an AI agent. One of the hot areas of research in AI safety is to come up with efficient algorithms for assistance games or efficient algorithms for human in the loop. A human agent is required. Okay. Right now, if a human agent is required, um, a human input is required, then the human needs to do it for a long, long time, which is not efficient. Uh, another area of interest is to redo all areas of AI that assume a fixed objective goal, loss, or reward function. This is everything we have in AI right now. So we have to fix this particular problem that there is one objective, it doesn't change at all, it encompasses everything that we want and we need to solve for it. Another thing that is becoming a focus of attention is the fact that humans are imperfect. So even if you're learning from human agents, they are imperfect. Their reward functions are not necessarily the best. They are not optimal. They make mistakes. This is something that is being taken into account for uh, enhancement of robustness and safety in AI. Another very interesting area of research is when there are multiple humans. There's a huge problem when we have multiple humans. Let's say, I'm going to give you a quick example and then I'll end this talk. You work for a self-driving car company. You've created a self-driving car. 
Now, a trolley problem is something that you need to consider. What's a trolley problem? Your car has lost its brakes. It's at an intersection. It can either swerve right and kill a 90-year-old grandma or swerve left and kill a four-year-old child. Which one should it go for? That's an ethical problem with practical impl implications in AI. That's one of the things that my lab works on as well. It turns out that the decision differs between different cultures. Not even different cultures. People in Boston make a different decision culturally and people in Los Angeles. So this is one of the things that needs to be taken into account when you're learning from human preferences. All right, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Any questions? <coughs> okay. I really enjoyed the course. I'm going to be available if you have any questions. I'm going to be available until the 22nd. As I said, go over the results, particularly for your midterm, and make sure that everything is okay. If I've given you points that you think you don't deserve, you don't have to let me know. If you think I haven't given you points that you deserve, let me know. Those grades are going to be posted probably to me and the, part the corresponding images. If you have any questions related to any of the topics we've covered or anything else related to you can email me anytime. It doesn't have to be in this semester. If you have a question next semester, if you have a question 10 years from now, as long as I'm alive and physically capable, I'm going to try my best to respond. Um, I hope that you've had fun. Again, thank you. I really enjoyed the course. Have a great winter break and finals week and all that. Should you object? No, I'll take what? You don't have to. But if you do, I would consider that a plus when I'm grading.